Welcome everybody. This is Jason helping out today's pre-show analyst desk translation. And we're going to be joined by Mina, our beautiful, beautiful SK host, and also Victory and Medlife as our analysts. Welcome everybody. So let's go through what happened at LTK last week. Let's go through some highlight clips. So those are the two only teams with all victories at Griffin and Sandbox. We could see their dominant performance and clean engagement. Especially Sandbox. Actually, people thought they're as an underdog, but they're now they're performing so well. And moving on to Chovy, he is pulling off great performance and showing KDA of 84. Chovy just has one, just only one death so far, and reaching up to 84 KDA so far. And Viper had his first penta kill of LCK Spring Split 2019. I think Viper proved that he is good both on AD carries and also non AD carry champions. Especially that Pentakill on Kaisa was the highlight of last week. And moving on to Afrika Freaks, they were pulling up some crazy and unorthodox drafts and entries and rosters, and they were able to pick up their first victory. However, they also had some failure on their new tech, new strategies, so I guess they have to bring some new strategy today. And also, let's move on to Tarzan. He tried this new Redemption Olaf. It was very sensational. Now, it's a trend in all of the solo queues and also other pro games. Everyone, uh, everyone is trying to find out who is the first one to try the Redemption Olaf in the solo queues. Then let's check out the standings so far. Griffin and Sandbox never had a loss yet. The fun thing is that Sandbox and also Damon Gaming, they just recently joined LCK from last promotion, but they're performing so well. Yeah. Moving on to bottom half, Hana Life Esports, KT, Genji Esports, Africa Freaks, and Junior Green Wings. They are all trying new stuff and trying to play off the best they can do. So we are looking forward to seeing their improved performance. And these are the MVP standings. Tarzan and Khalid are both on tie with 400 points. The highlight, uh, we can say that mostly there are, there are a lot of junglers in the top standings, but there are also Chovy, Ghost, and Teddy included in the standings. We can say that the jungle participation is a very crucial part of the whole game, but we have to see what other laners can pull off this week. And these are the KDS standings of each line. Sword is up in the first place with 7.9. I think this reflects the dominant performance of Griffin. And Sword especially is always doing so much for the team, but he's still remaining such a great KDA, which also means that he's the best player so far. And moving on to jungle, it's again Tarzan from Griffin. 14 KDA. But at the same time, we have to say KDA doesn't actually refer to the performance because Marlong, actually from Gina Greenings, they are very low in the ranks and Marlong is not really not really showing a, a high car kill participation, but still he's on the second place of jungle KDA. And mid laner also, Chovy from Griffin is on the first place. 84 is literally insane. It is not 8.4, it's 84. We'll have to find out how many deaths will Chovy make this week. And let's move on to AD Carry. 
Again, Viper from Griffin is on the first place with 15.4. Well, Sangyun is also showing great KDA despite of despite his low rank in the standings of the whole team, but he's still performing so well as an ADK player. Support again, Griffin Lehens. We can say all the five Griffin players are on the first place, and his KDA also proves that he is performing so well and also participating so well during the team fights. I guess support players have to also take care about their plays and participation, and also their play. As I support myself, I want to say seeing the hands performing so well makes me feel a little bit satisfied. Then, let's move on to the upcoming schedules and new patch notes. The new champion Silas will be available after February 13th. We'll have to find out what is the best strategy or tactics to pull off from Silas. And there was this big patch in jungle. The overall experience scaling decreased, and also there was a change in challenging smites. The damage decreased. And there were these top 8 pick and ban champions getting nerfed. Those are the OP champions so far. So there were big nerfs on those champions. But still, Orga and Aatrox seem very strong. And Galio Rakan got nerfed so bad. Well, we have to find out if we can still use it in the 9.2 patch. Especially Rakan, the dash speed getting nerfed is really crucial. But there is a champion that is buffed. First is Aurelion Soul. Well, we haven't seen it locked in in LTK yet, but Aurelion Soul, the Q cooldown decreased and stun duration got longer for bigger stars. And also, Kane, it's a very mainstream pick in LPL also. The passive has been changed a lot, the so unlock process for Kane has been changed, so. I think a lot of pro players are trying to trying some experiments on Kane nowadays. Well, Aurelian Soul has never been a mainstream, but it is one of the most picks of Fly, so maybe it can be a good pocket pick for Genji Esports. Then let's go to the schedules of this week. Today, it will be Damon Gaming vs. Zenbox and Africa Freaks vs. Genera Green Wings. And tomorrow, it's a big day. Griffin vs. SK Telecom and Genji against KT Rockstar. So we are seeing a lot of top teams facing up each other and a lot of lower teams facing up each other. So it's going to be really exciting. <laughs> a lot of people can say these schedules are scripted, but it is not. It was planned before the split. What are the highlights of this week then? Obviously, it's gonna be Griffin versus SK Telecom. There are so many hype around it. And this Saturday, Griffin and Sandbox are facing up against each other. So we will have to find out who is the, which, which one will be the first one to face the first loss of the split. Maybe this week can be a momentum for, for all the teams because we're having a long vacation next week, so we hope to see great performance from all the teams and hope they can have a really nice vacation after this week. So this will wrap up today's pre-show analyst desk and we're going to move on to today's first series, Taiwan Gaming and Sandbox. Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen.
the 2019 LCK Spring. Finally, we are here at the Castle Desk. I am Atlas, and this is, of course, Papa Smithy to start week number three and patch 9.2, which is why you got the beautiful uh, interviews and the pre-show brought to you by G-Sun as well. So excited to see what's going to change moving into today. And something is changing. I'm back, Atlas. <laughs> I had two match days away from the LCK. Your first the weekend in so long when I it comes did. to the LCK really actual enjoyed, schedule. Really enjoyed my Sunday watching you guys <laughs> cram in six games. I was at home putting my feet up, but now get to be back here. So thank you very much for having me back. And I'm excited. Patch 9.2. It's not a big change. It feels like 9.3 has a lot more of those big nerfs. The Akali nerfs, my eyes just dilate looking at oh, them yeah. and wondering if we'll ever see an Akali again. But for now, we'll see some Akali, we'll see some fun, and we get to see a first match where Sandbox Gaming, we're talking about how by the yeah. end of this week, they have two difficult assignments. Dumb One Gaming today, Griffin later in the week. This is going to be a really fun one to see if they can get over Dumb One, because Dumb One's certainly out of form recently, but I think they could match up pretty well into Sandbox. Yeah, and of course, they've got experience against Sandbox as well, playing through Challenger together. So we'll see exactly whether or not Dumb One can continue their more dominant streak against Sandbox, or whether it's going to be Sandbox continuing their LCK undefeated streak as uh, Challenger's career syndrome is an interesting uh, way to coin this one, but promotion friends may not necessarily be the case as they clash on the rift. Ghost has become the Holy Spirit. Now, this has nothing to do with the Freak of Freaks. Yep. What we're saying here is that Ghost has definitely risen up many tiers since his struggles in 2018. A player who debuted very young in 2016, just after his 17th birthday. Didn't see much of him, played one single Twitch game with Mad Life, who's now, of course, on the yep. analyst desk. Since then, has slowly warmed up. Decent 2017, poor 2018, but looks great so far this season. And against Nuclear, he might find an opposition where, once again, we might see him pop off in the bot lane. Yeah, things certainly could be difficult for him. And of course, Griffin coming up as their next matchup. Dumb one into Griffin is going to be a very tough schedule for Sandbox. Their final test, it feels like, in the first round robin of the LCK for 2019. Having a look at some of the stats, the first blood is what really stands out in our minds. Dumb one starting the games a lot more slowly than all of our other teams. Canyon kind of does it differently. If you look at his priorities so far, four games of Kha'Zix, three games of Nocturne, not going to get much started yeah. on these champions. Only Talia has a lot of agency early, hasn't been playing the Camille that, of course, we know he can play, played in Kesper Cup, and a big favorite for On Fleek. Very interesting to see if that's contested today. We'll roll some highlights here. Definitely going to be front-loaded some of Dumb One's best moments, but even in that SKT series, quite popped off, and they did have that victory over the Dream Team in game number two. Yeah, that game two was an absolute baller from uh, the man on the bottom side of the map. This Rakan has been ridiculous in the hands of Hoyt, but now it's been nerfed on 9.2. Are we going to see the same level of priority for that champion. The grand entrance does feel a lot slower now. It just feels like Rakan aged 30 years since <laughs> yeah, patch 9.1. <laughs> He's trying to make another go of it, but he just can't hit the blocks as fast as he could anymore. Yeah. Still very dashing, he can still impress you, and the quickness is still a pretty cool ability, but especially in lane, if you try to hit people with your W without the R riding you as you slowly glide down the rift, it just looks sad at us. So I imagine the priority has to be lower but win rate wise, it's kind of really what Nuclear and Hoyt have found all their success on. Yeah, exactly. Is Zion Rakan. So that's something we can't take for granted anymore. And we'll just see how things look as Sandbox, it can't stop winning. Enjoyed them playing some more up to date 9.1 League of Legends when I was watching their victory at the tail end of week number two. And just will there ever be a time where Sandbox dissipates and the results fall away? Because right now, it's just ultimate consistency. And even with the Lee Sin being rocked by On Fleet. Yeah, exactly right. And look, I want to talk about the jungle matchup as well as we're going to start with the top side of the map. Nuggery versus Summit is certainly something that we need to look at. Nuggery, like you can see that KDA, that's certainly very low, but that's because he gets all of the attention from everyone, whoever goes up against Darmon, because they know what happens if you leave him alone in an early game. He just carries the game by himself. But Summit, to his credit, you know, he has bigger numbers, doesn't mean too much early in the season. Sandbox hasn't had any losses yeah. apart from a single game. But Summit has shown, you know, he's got the pocket Darius that no one else is playing around, and that makes you so worried about a Scion lane. Usually Scion is just the ultimate, uh, at worst, going even, sometimes winning lanes against some tough opponents, but Darius doesn't number. 
on that Scion. So very interesting to see a blue side Scion ban possibility. Speaking of blue, it's the boys in blue on the left side of your screen. First introduction to Dumb One Gaming. Crashing down to earth, 4-0 start in game score. Now two match losses in a, in a row. They had a pretty easy victory over Sandbox preseason. How will things look now? Well, they've got some opportunities to bounce back here. It's going to be up against Sandbox today, which is their toughest one of the week. And then Kingzone will be following up in a couple of days' time. So theoretically, some chances for Darmon to bounce back. It's 9.2. The honeymoon phase of getting used to the lights here is over. And now we get to know a bit more about Sandbox and Damwon. My prediction preseason was that Damwon would have the mechanical talent, but might fall away just because they're sometimes less than some of their parts. Sometimes yes. they're just five very mechanical players. These guys have been the epitome of more than the sum of their parts. The strategy has been the lovely thing to track when it comes to sandbox gaming. And who's to say they don't enter that Griffin series 5-0? and oh, They should come in favorites today. Yeah, they certainly should. Haven't lost a match just yet. And the only game that they've lost was against SK Telecom. It dealt with Darmwon Gaming earlier on. So if you're looking at current power levels based on the opposition that both of these two teams have faced, you have to give it in favor of Sandbox. And you're talking about more than the sum of their parts. I feel like Joker on the bottom side of the map really does epitomize that. The old man mechanics still able to bring out the Thresh five games so far and an 80% win rate is pretty damn good. So we're gonna show you the lineups. Nothing is going to change as far as these two teams. Very, very comfortable with the Rosses that they have. Maybe our next matchup is where we're gonna see some craziness when it comes to the rosters, but certainly not here. And I'm looking at Canyon. When he goes up against Onfleek, it might be different here in 9.2, but he hasn't been stepping up as much as Onfleek has in the LCK. I wanna see some more Casper Cup Canyon coming out. I just wanna see some new champions. We'll talk about a yeah. more champ select, but I wanna see something more aggressive. People really have very different ideas of what to expect when it comes to competitive jungling on 9.2. You, know, you were talking about Ivern, and a lot of people are yeah. whispering about that. The tanks are back, sort of, but the carries are sort of also the only way you can go. What is the strongest right now because of the experience changes? It's either get really snowballing with an aggressive pick or maybe farm it up, and if the ganks don't go the way of the aggressive pick, outscale slowly. It's very hard to yeah. know which way will actually work better in practice. I understand the arguments for both. And that's why I'm happy to have some data points. We're the debut of patch 9.2 because of the earlier starts. No longer do we start on Tuesday because we start on Wednesdays. One day later means the patch is a week in the can, which means we get the changes first again, Atlas. So the LCK leads the way, at least in patches. What does it mean in terms of the meta? We'll find out very soon as champion select is only around the corner. Yeah, we're about to get in there. And yeah, talking about the jungle, excited to see whether it is going to be the low econ idea or whether it is just farm it out, get more money, maybe compensate for those lack of levels that you are going to get. But let's waste no more time. Here is Champion Select, and we'll see how the bans are going to change and where the priorities are going to go with a lot of very high priority champions taking some big hits in 9.2. But Cassiopeia. not Lucian and Cassiopeia. Yeah, not so much. And uh, Lucian, not at all, which is just ridiculous, as Camille's going to be banned away from on fleek. Very understandable. You'd either have to pick it away or ban it away, it feels like, going up against Sambo. So the big Camille nerf is on PBE. 9.3, no longer stunning camps. I think that does trash a lot of what makes Jungle Camille strong. So that's still a later thing. And on fleek, like you say, is by no comparison, the best yes. Camille jungle we have in the LCK. Kaisa will be banned. Against Damwon, notice no Rakan ban after Rakan was heavily nerfed on patch 9.2, which is live for today. Aatrox had a slight nerf, still going to be first picked for Damwon Gaming. The Urgot, again, a slight nerf, will be picked as well. Yes, and we'll see whether Rakan still comes up, but Galio, no worries there. Dove going to pick that one up, certainly does like the champion, but now doing much less damage on that Winds of War, and I believe this is Hotfix 9.2 as well, so that Justice Punch has been tuned back up again just a tad. Basically, it was a Q and E double nerf into just a heavy Q nerf. Seems yes. to be what's live for today. That's the way we'll be talking about it anyway. I don't mind Urgot and Galio taken. Yes, the Galio power level is down, but a lot of what Sandbox have been defined by is very smart early game rotations to get full value out of Rift Herald charges and just gold plating. They're so good at taking down gold plates and playing around a skirmish advantage in the jungle. 
that taking reliable solo laners is a pretty good way to go. I think we will still see Aurelia from time to time, especially in the mid lane. Against squishy uh, control mages, say for example, Aurelia versus Zoe, I think Aurelia is still super strong because you still have very yep. high base damage on taking things down. But some of the matchups where Disarm allowed her to win have been removed. And again, she gets further nerfs on patch 9.3. Rai is going to be preferred for the side of Damwon Gaming. They're still going to be going for something they play well. Not going to flex to the bot lane with the Ezreal lock-in. We may be seeing Ghost on his trusty Victor bot lane after all. Yeah, we could certainly be seeing that. That being said, Joker is one of our players that does like to play a bit of that Galio support. And now maybe with a little bit of damage gone, you just want to have that utility in there and put him on the bottom side of the map. Feels like it would actually work out relatively well as a bot lane pick now. I'm taking the tact of not talking about it because, as you know, I'm a big hater of the <laughs> current patch yep. support Gallia. Uh -huh. After they remove the percentage damage reduction on ultimate, I think you just have to be building AP to make the champion work. But you're right, we have to mention it because Sandbox are the only team to rock it. Speaking of rocking it, we have two dumb one champions, which are usually red side last picks, actually banned away on the red side by Sandbox. The Vladimir power level, even in solo queue in Korea, almost permaban status on the Vladimir. So no big surprise that it's taken away. And Jax, one of those champions who's largely escaped any heavy nerfs, going to be banned away. So that's three potential top laners and an on-fleet jungle special banned away in the second round. Yeah, of course, the leap strike, a little bit less damage and base attack. And it was lowered on the Jax, but otherwise nothing to write home about. On-fleet continuing along the trend of having some... Uh, more damage in the jungle, the Lee Sin is going to be the final lock-in here, and his Lee Sin looked good the last time we saw it on the Rift. First jungle lock-in, okay, and Aatrox may be a flex, but yep. first jungle confirmed lock-in so far on 9.2, and it's a champion that's okay at level two, but will get to level six slower because of all the experience nerfs. Yeah. So let's just watch that. I want you, Atlas, to keep that pen, you're left-handed, just to I am. give that information out there. <laughs> and note down level six timings for some of these jungles, especially ones that don't get snowballed, because level sixes in general should be coming a little bit later. Lee Sin can often fall into power farm to level six territory. And while the gold is there, the experience is not. To d guarantee a decent timing, Kha'Zix's going to be the confirmed jungler on the side of Damwon. So Kanye going to stick with his most played. And Hoyt blind picks support and will go the way of the Alistair with quite a few supports available. Yeah, Alistair and Ezreal locked in for the bottom lane here for Damwon Gaming, meaning that we're going to have the Ryzen Aatrox somewhere in a solo lane as oh, there's the LeBlanc. It. Oh, no. Yep. And uh, look, that, this is why I had to talk about it, Pop oh, Smitty, no. because uh, it's uh, 9.2 and uh, his damage is less. So let's uh, put the Galio in the support position. I can understand old man Joker's uh, mindset. I can feel it. But I just, no. I, <laughs> I cannot know, you replace, are so tilted right I now. just can't <laughs> replace Shen with Galio. I can't abide by it, Atlas, because I know. Galio had a lot of Q nerfs, and the only other thing he could do than all in in lane was to help push, and even that's worse now. Yes. So really not a big fan of it, but it is something that Sandbox likes to do, and the one thing it does do does play into our scouting report based on week one of Sandbox, which is really flexible. Darius in any lane, Galio in any lane, they rely on the flex push nature. And because it's Alistair, a support champion that really only all ends, maybe you can baby a support Galio through the laning phase and get away with it. And also you can put the hero's entrance down basically where, wherever you want. Mimic Distortion will allow for that positioning to be very, very flexible. Not to mention Lee Sin getting around as well. We're gonna start by having a look at the roster that's been put together by Damwon still. If you're looking at 9.1, these are some power picks in the majority of the roles, but we'll see whether Kha'Zix is going to have more trouble getting to that level six mark, getting that first evolution down, see whether Aatrox has been hit enough to keep him down. And it does feel like the first set on a new patch where there hasn't been a lot of time off and people yeah. largely playing the same stuff, but a lot of this stuff is a bit all worn, a little bit battle ridden in the first couple of weeks. So let's see the effectiveness of some of the picks that were an afterthought in week number one and two. Yep, exactly right. And here we are onto the rift for game number one of week three, LCK 2019. Well, according to my ears, we are on the Darmon side of the stadium, Papa Smithy, because that was deafening. Darmon really picking up a lot of fans so far at the beginning of this LCK split. And again, guys, go back to the VODs for Casper Cup, which was what, now a month and a half ago? Yeah, something like that. And Not just far. listen to the decibel changes. It's no uh, 
uh, sleight of hand by us, really you can see a team who was struggling to get any fan chance going, now having a bit of synergy there, now having a bit of gusto, and that's after a 0-2 week. Damwon had, of course, the very tricky task of facing Griffin and SKT in week two of the LCK. Only got a single game win between those two sets. Griffin will play SKT in our first set tomorrow, but zooming into today, definitely the match of the day in yes. Sandbox versus Damwon, and a match where Based on match score, you're very confident that Sandbox should look good. But I'm not ready to count out Dumwon Gaming. Although with this draft, a lot has stayed the same except for some keystones. Nuggery has the grasp on the Aatrox, and Showmaker goes back to the Aftershock, yeah. so defense tree in both solar lanes. Oh, boy. Going to get a bit of a cute auto headbutt combo there onto Joker, and Joker is not going to mind about it too much. Decent trade back as Dove's taken already a fair bit of damage here in the mid lane. Excited to see whether this uh, Grasp of the Undying Aatrox is going to help him out as far as uh, how he's been touched in the patch 9.2 run. But it was basically the Umbral Dash nerf as far as cooldown and then a bit of scaling rather than the base damages on the Q. It's a really small nerf. It's about 5% scaling yeah. nerf. So it's, I think of it as like a 0.05 AP ratio kind of nerf. Maybe a 0.1 AP ratio. Obviously, it's an AD champion. But what I mean is that's a small number. So it's not going to be the biggest change overall in his play patterns or indeed in his burst ranges. And the 10 mana nerf on Urgot is annoying. Doesn't always build a lot of mana items in the early game. Wants to mainline a Black Cleaver. So again, very small touches, but it's the sort of nerfs that should bring a champion's overall win rate down in solo queue, 1%, right? It's one of those yeah. very small nerfs. But in competitive play, it can be different. As Onfi gives up his red, he's going on Canyon. Yeah, Q's going to land. He's going to get the smite off, so the execute damage, not going to do a whole lot there, but still gets the flash because his bottom lane rotates first. And also because it's QW and the scaling here in terms of abilities taken, no jump available to the Kha'Zix. Very interesting path. If you look at the minimap, it was Wolves start solo with a W start into the Raptors. And you sometimes see a Raptors start Kha'Zix once in a while into bot side Scuttle. Onflake seemed ahead of it and was willing to give up his blue releashing to both get a summoner out of it, the enemy jungler, but also more importantly, just stay ahead and keep up that Rift Tower. You need every piece of experience early you can get. Well, we're going to have a look at the Keystone choice here for Showmaker and have and show you the other runes as well. You can see, of course, Mana Flow, Band of Transcendence, both taken, but gets to take Demolish here on the rise and can start getting to these turret plates a little bit earlier if he can keep the Harass up on LeBlanc in lane. Was of course just taking the electrocute as per usual on the LeBlanc on fleek back down towards the bottom side of the map. Level three with that scuttle crab and Joker also walking out. Yeah, does get the justice punch there, but good headbutt to avoid getting hit. So have to get a defensive flash away there. The Lee Sin had already revealed himself. The damage bursts about 400 from a Lee Sin with red buffs. So wanted to be respectful there. Doesn't feel good because it's still a successful gank overall on the side of Sandbox. Another good moment, and all Kha'Zix can do is actually pick up one of the first spawn Rift Scuttles. Feels good for the Kha'Zix, but those damage nerfs to experience, and if you look at it, I tried to do the math, and it's yeah, yeah. overall about a 20 to 32% nerf on jungle experience scaling, and it's also every second level that the experience on the jungle camp scales. That's a big number. That is something yeah. very relevant, and it just means that some of your breakpoints, just the time at which a jungler hits level six relative to a mid laner. There were times where it's around the same time. There was times where you were one level down. It's very possible in the mid game to be three levels down on the enemy jungle without stuffing up. And that lets you know that things are very different about how the play patterns might be. And also what the jungle meta might be is you might have to move away from a level. Uh, champions who scale on levels very strongly in the early game, say skirmishing jungles that want to be around the same level, that want three points in your hookshot, for example, the Camille and towards tanks who just kind of need a Cinder Hulken to be all right. There is that very real chance that the agreement by a week into patch 9.2 might be to remove some of these skirmishing junglers from the current map. Yeah, which is why that uh, Ivern seems to be something that's very popular with a lot of people talking about it on Twitter at the moment. We do hate Ivern in Korea. We've never had an Ivern I hate up. Ivern just in general, so and that's I'm fair. happy with it. Well, then you agree with the Korean opinion, yeah. even when other regions were playing the Ivern. I think of the most famous Korean Ivern player, and it's Trick over in G2 uh, when yeah. he was over in Europe. Uh, we just had no Ivern here because of his inability to skirmish, but maybe skirmishing takes a back seat with so many experienced nurse. We're not to know. We're still learning 
in accordance with you, Twitch Chad. It's a bit of a learning day here. Patch 9.2, no data points. We'll learn about it as Canyon slowly inches his way towards level 6. Yeah, he's just slinking down towards the bottom side of the map here as Ghost and Joker might be under fire. No flashes have been taken down just yet, but Control Ward should be removed here by the Kha'Zix. Out of the way, the Winds of War uh, there is that Justice Punch was an odd one there from Joker. Doesn't go over the wall, mate. Yeah, that's not how that one works. No harm, no foul on that one, though. Joker, he'll get away with that one. I was a big fan of his Shen pick. Again, yeah. so weird to see support Shen after no one would dare pick it. But as it came together in the match they won, it was very impressively piloted. And then Tucson said, yes, I have a reason to play this. <laughs> I can get an MVP again. Woohoo! It's always like that, though, when someone actually has the uh, spheres to lock in. One of those old favorites. All the old mains can return to it. Uh huh. I must admit, during my time off, got to watch some LPL top lane Riven pop off. And... I would love to see Smab jump back onto the Riven. We and do have a lot of... some uh, Riven play in general. We have a lot of carry top laners that certainly would want any opportunity to get back on that champion. Not this game, though. We've got the standard Aatrox and the Urgot. In game one well, we're getting of week the three. We're also getting the standard Sandbox game. And only really now, fifth set that they've played in the LCK, can we understand what that means. What I've been most impressed by, both by watching them up close and getting a chance to watch one of their matches at home and pay a bit more attention to some of the intangibles of this team is really smart at playing the current meta. And you might say, okay, well, what is the current meta? Is it flex picks? Is it something else? It's getting the most gold in the first 14 minutes of the game. It's min-maxing all the extra gold in the game. Because with experience going down, junglers can't get uh, experience and gold, but they can still get mountains of gold. They're really smart about getting the most scuttles in the game, or getting so many turret plates in the game, about always taking Rift Herald around 10 to 12 minutes. And that gold serves them up, where in the mid game, they're kind of bloodlessly 4,000 gold ahead. And you can stuff up on some macro, you can run at Baron too many times, and still have that gold buffer that your smart first 15 minutes or so provided you. So even little things like on flick, knowing the pathing of Canyon and blowing the flash of the enemy Kha'Zix early, relieved a lot of pressure and allowed them to stack the deck when it came to early gold. It's not being seen right now, but that is to me the biggest standby of Sandbox Gaming in the first two weeks is getting that early gold. Yeah, and also, you know, Sandbox, we, we talk about the fact that their barons have been very interesting, not necessarily super intelligent, but they have been making the plays as aggressively as they possibly can. They're doing can. things, Atlas. They're that's not just I mean. being scaled on. They're being proactive in a meta that's defined by proactivity like this. Yeah, there's the flash kick. Showmaker still gets tagged by the Q. The chains are going to land, and the rise after shock or no is going to go down on fleek with another first blood. Engage range is just so insane when it's Lee Sin and LeBlanc. Galio kind of has to slowly watch on and almost KSs <laughs> with the Q. Bad, yeah. Just wanted an involvement there, some experience. Gets level six from that one, which is relevant. Nice play there. And one of the reasons that LeBlanc is one of the mid lane only champions we still have in the meta is because any of that CC hits, any of the engage opens up on your opponent, the chains come down, and the death is pretty inevitable. Yep, and Showmaker, of course, had a lot of control in that lane earlier on, but now LeBlanc picking up that assist very early on, able to stay in that lane, pushes forward, gets a tower plate. This is exactly what Sandbox want to be able to do, is Canyon's going to jump forward, looking for Onflick, misses the W, though, as Joker looking for the flash, and the respect flash immediately comes out from Canyon. And that's something support Galio can do, get respect flashes pretty wantonly, just with the threat, and doesn't need cask available to make it happen like a Gragas. Watch the replay here. Consider that Showmaker's on the left side of the lane and still dies because Lee Sin has safeguard flash kick. And there's no escape there the moment the chain comes down. Lee Sin and the LeBlanc isn't quite Lee Sin Yasuo in terms of synergy, but you understand why the pairing works oh so well. Very nicely played there. Again, some very nice aggressive League of Legends coming in. Speaking of aggressive League of Legends. Yep, Realm Wolf gonna come in. Rune Prison is going to lock down Summit for the moment. He's very close to his turret though, and I don't think they've got the damage. Showmaker slowed down. But not going to take an extra turret shot. Now Nugger is looking for this turret plate, gets it with the Demolish Pro. If the Summoner was down there, the flash down on Summit, I think you try the turret dive, but it just wasn't realistically gonna happen in spite of Nagari's ultimate being available. Just so crisp, Sandbox's execution compared to what was available there and just the safety provided by Urgot LeBlanc. Urgot LeBlanc solo lanes, it didn't end up being the Galio like we first thought of, but even if it was Galio, very safe defensively. And Sandbox read the map, they communicate well. When they make their play, they're crisp. And on the defense, they have the ability to dodge ganks. 
in the kit provided to the Urga. Yeah, and as if we have a look at these uh, team compositions and how they fare throughout this game as well, I feel like Damwon aren't too worried about First Blood going down there in the mid lane because I feel like they're happy to try and scale this one as quickly as they can. They've got three tiers that are going to be stacking over two of their champions. Wanting to make sure that they can get in good positions. And once that Abyssal Mask, I assume, that Showmaker is building is completed, it's going to be so incredibly valuable against the LeBlanc and the Victor. Not sure if you can... Well, I guess because it's Victor, you can do it. Again, Abyssal Mask does provide a decent amount of health. So you're probably right. It probably will eventually be an Abyssal Mask. To me, the tipping point for this game is not just, okay, your tier items are transformed, but actually, when can Rise handle LeBlanc in a side lane? Because it actually takes a while. It takes two, three yeah. item completions to be there, to actually be able to out-trade the LeBlanc and not just be free food to a LeBlanc who just goes for damage and has that extra oomph in the early game. When that happens, I think the side lane assignments should be more flexible than what Sandbox has. But in the mid-game, Sandbox have a lot of pick and a lot of mobility to get that pick to happen. It's only when the side lanes come together that I think the team fight also will force Sandbox into maybe a small lose-lose situation. Yeah. Darmon should be able to play out the 1-3-1 a little bit more cleanly than what Sandbox have been able to do. Eventually. For now, yes. I like Sandbox yes. in the 1-3-1. I think also they have the superior one-item power spike. So because of that, Darmon just need to fly the white flag, but as low as possible. You don't want to be conspicuous about it. You don't want to give away too many free objectives to the side of Sandbox. Yeah, if you're going to fly the, the, the flag, then fly it in your backyard, not in your front yard. Something like that. Make sure you keep it a little Did bit you ever have a, a flag in your backyard no. growing up? No. No, I mean, Australians do have it. doesn't feel like it's as much of a trope as yeah, with Americans. We're just not really all about the nationalism. You say that, much. but we kind of are. On your birthday, we are. Australia Day, the 26th of January. I was watching at home, in case you guys were wondering. I had a great birthday. There was a, a little bit of drinking after the broadcast. <laughs> you were there, Atlas. <laughs> Can you agree? Is a little bit the correct adjective? Um, that's, that's not what I'd say in my professional Give me your opinion. word. I would say uh, indulgent would be my word. Indignant? <laughs> no. Indicative? <laughs> it was indicative of a birthday. <laughs> exactly what, what it a was. A birthday of my country. <laughs> exactly. How can I not salute my country without a beverage or two? That's true. We would not be Australian if that was the case. I can't speak about the subsequent beverages. <laughs> well, let's talk about the subsequent ganks here, because recreating this mid lane gank, even with the chain, isn't going to happen yet. And we still haven't seen our first hero's entrance come 13 minutes. Yeah, but on Flick's going to see a lot of damage taken here. The Q wants to come down that. Hero's entrance you were talking about is going to attempt to save on Fleek, and now they're thinking about the return. It's Hoyt taking a lot of damage, but does have that ultimate running. True shot barrage over a couple of members, but Sandbox are able to make it to relative safety. Long cooldown used, and no value from the defensive ultimate there. So nice to bait that one out. And when Hero's entrance is down, you're a flash torn and nothing else as a Galio, especially with the Winds of Warner on this patch. So approach here has to be careful. Damn one have priority topside. Will Sandbox try to brute force to contest on the 14-minute Rift Terror? Well, complete vision is available here for Sandbox Gaming as they're thinking about taking this one as a leash. On Fleet gets all of his health back, teleport to bring five members up towards Shelly. She is a very popular lady, and it feels like both of these junglers are going to have an opportunity to try and steal as there's a Justice Punch. And see you later, Nuclear. That was a very weird teleport. Canyon's going to pay for it as well as Nuggery. Has to Umbral Dash to get over that wall and back underneath his turret. First whoopsie of patch 9.2 goes the way of one. Nuclear. Just gives it up for free. You have to respect the engage there, and it's just a aggressive teleport. This is, of course, more likely to be seen from 80 carries than other, re than other roles that are more used to using the teleport, but teleport changes were a patch ago. Feels like a bit of old news, and Sandbox Gaming. They're going to inflict a much bigger punishment than just a kill. They're going to take down the mid lane outer turret basically for free. Yep. They would take so much from that one. That being said, Shelly did go over to Canyon. So theoretically, they will have an opportunity to get a little bit back. Didn't actually see when he was able to pick that one up. But thankfully for Darmwan, it wasn't a complete loss on every single side. Going to watch the replay here again. Very, very simple to understand. They get the rip out, like you say. So they get out with something. But just a bit of a brain fade, I would say, coming through from Nuclear. As a picture in picture, the LeBlanc's doing some damage. Yep, Nuclear is going to go down yet again. And Dove, this is exactly the snowball that Sandbox wanted. We mentioned things like when can the Rise stand in a side lane against the LeBlanc? Well, 
She's 1-0 and 3 against 0-1-0. It's going to take him a hell of a lot longer based on this early game. And that's the rise. The Ezreal isn't going to be building any irrelevant magic resist. And I didn't actually see the start to understand how LeBlanc got even within distortion range. But sometimes things like that can happen when the lanes are broken a bit. We just had a skirmish, so lane assignments on his fix. Speaking of lane assignments. Oh, here we go, Dove looking for another one. The chain. Flash to try and get Showmaker out of there as he's turning it. The ultimate's running here from Canyon. The first explosion of damage down on the Lee Sin as Distortion gets Dove out a little bit further. Mimic still available, but not going to go back in 1v2. And Canyon with the R Evolve able to close the distance and make something happen and needed to. This game was snowballing away from the control of Dam1 Gaming. First good moment in the game. Be able to punish on Flake, opening up with Burst. Didn't see where the chain went, but clearly wasn't enough to matter there. Let's watch the replay to understand. And this is just Dove and two control wards and Nuclear saying, oh, a minion wave. It's farming time. It was not, sorry. It's actually dinner time, and well, that means he's not going to be farming for a while. Free yeah. kill goes the way of Sandbox, and that is a big VOD review moment for Coach Kim Jong-soo, the coach of Damon Gaming, just to go through what happens after a skirmish, because that was nuclear not thinking, and the sort of resting mechanics you can't allow to happen. But that's so easy to punish for the LeBlanc. Yeah, just mindlessly going back down towards the bottom side of the map, and then getting punished. For it in the end, losing on Fleek, certainly going to get done one something back, but one to four is the kill score now. 2,000 gold, approximately the lead for Sandbox Gaming, and based on what we've seen in the LCK so far, this is what we should expect moving into this series, but can they hold on and keep this lead building? The answer to your question, effectively, rather than just a allusion to 20 minutes from now, if we're talking about now, the answer is hell yes. And the reason oh, yeah. why I say that is, we got a rod of ages slowly stacking up. No oh, adaptive man. helm in the mid lane. There's no magic resist anywhere. So Victor and LeBlanc alone probably can 1v1 most champions. But if you get pick damage from both, half a rotation will kill someone. So Damwon Gaming uh, further playing into will be fine later. And that really opens up the game to be 1 free 30 from Sandbox. So right now, I think Damwon are kind of dulling their own blades a little bit and playing into Sandbox's current strength. I mean, that's a very bold choice but it's one where Sandbox should look at the inventories. If you press tab as Sandbox, you should be a bit annoyed. And from that, focus on getting those control wards down and forcing fights thick and fast early, because you're set up to win them. Yeah, it certainly is uh, a little bit disrespectful for Showmaker to go for that Rod of Ages. Personally think that this was a game where the Abyssal Mask would be a great choice on the rise. Not going to be the case though, as Ghost is now set up shop here in the mid lane. Just trying to hold on to these waves as they fly towards him. True Shot Barrage is not necessarily the best option as Shelly does start off here in the mid lane, but she's actually going to take a lot of damage before getting this charge off. If she even gets it, it's Dove. Double distorts forward. Can't really walk up and get a safe Rift Herald charge against this team with all the snowballing that's happening. So they're going to lose the Rift Herald for free. Yeah, absolutely nothing that they can do about it. It's now a fight breaking out in the river on fleet, taking a lot of damage there as the Chaos Storm does fly down. And Joker, once again, with the defensive hero's entrance. It's a defensive entrance, but you notice on fleet still has to flash. There's no damage reduction. So even then, isn't able to get any value there. So a long cooldown wasted a second time, but they got the Rift Herald. If you just say, Okay, it's on Flake's Flash for enemy Rift Herald, not even getting a base damage charge. It's still a win for the side of Sandbox. Oh, it certainly is. They're still full health, basically, on a lot of these turrets. Top lane out of, did uh, lose one plate. But otherwise, everything feeling like it's ship shape on the side of Sandbox. Perfect hex score done here for Ghost, lost chapter. Building up. See whether we see as many Oblivion Orbs now after the nerf as well in patch 9.2. Of course, a Showmaker special, but he's on the rise this time, not necessarily a champion that does like to build all that many Oblivion Orbs. I did a bit of research. Gold efficiency is definitely pretty far down. I think it's 88% now. Obviously, it was around 95, and yeah. Magic Pen is a stat that we've been conditioned to demand if you're playing Mages because it has become such a very cookie-cutter build of Ludens into... The Oblivion Orb, part of that was power level, part of that is his flat penetration against the lack of proliferation on magic resist. But remember, you get 8 MR as a base stat now. So you feel really good about that. It means that double magic pen doesn't put you into the same damage ranges as if you're getting close to true damage, you're really just being able to load on the damage, but the further away, you're getting more value out of that magic resist. So given all that, again, because it's day one, I think still plenty of Oblivion Orbs, but over time, the tendencies will change. Yeah, may get phased out. Dove, of course, is uh, on the hype train that you are referring to. Picks up the double magic pen as well as the Luden's Echo to try and blow up these squishies as effectively as possible. And we saw it worked on Nuclear on the bottom side of the map. 
Still not a lot of MR being put together, but there's the Hex Drinker done for Canyon. If we have a look at items, two items finished for Nuclear, two items finished for Noggery as well. But on the other side of the map, Ludens and Perfect Hex Core done. Summit's got everything that he wants. There is just a lot of power on this Sandbox roster. But this is the price you pay. Sandbox, the only bad thing is, they wish this was an Infernal. But they know that because it's double Ludens, double early power, it's not contestable to go near an objective that you don't have early vision on. There is that Infernal at 26 minutes. To me, that's where the rubber hits the road for this game. It's another fight where the items just won't be scaled yet. The dumb one, they'll be close to. A full stack Rod of Ages, so that will be there, but there won't be three item builds yet on champions like Rise. It's still a time where Sandbox should be ripe to blow open the game, but if Dumb One Gaming can steal an Infernal at a time where Sandbox's draft should still be in the Ascendancy, maybe there is light at the end of the tunnel for Dumb One Gaming. Exactly. Four and a half minutes on that dragon before that one comes up. Smart of Sandbox to cycle the ocean as quickly as they possibly could. Ghost going to turn up to the top side of the map and just clear things out as the victor. Very, very comfortable just uh, nullifying that bottom lane on this champion. I think the easiest way to explain this is that, you know, when you buy the ride skip, the uh, line skipping at, Disney, at Disneyland or something like that, yeah, where yeah, you yeah. are able to just go apart. That's what Sandbox have. They have the first access to everything because their items are better early and the enemy can't afford to fight there. But if you don't show up and... The queue is already there. You don't get the same value. So what's happened here very clearly is they've got the inside track to everything, to Sandbox, but they need to get that. They need to get there early and claim it. Otherwise, there's still a real chance that Dumb One Gaming in a very low kill game, if it stays one to four in 10 minutes time, there's a real chance Dumb One. Yeah, there certainly is a clock on this one for Dumb One, but it's a decent time for Sandbox so far as Dove's gonna move on over. World Ender very early from Noggery as he's trying to stick underneath this turret. He's going to be able to use it, avoids dying to the ultimate, but the repositioning is going to be good from Summit, and the dive should be easy. Elementary, my dear Watson, as Sandbox Gaming take him down under the turret, and now look to destroy that as well. And Damon Gaming try to play three lanes. Noggery is known to do this. He does push up very far with no vision at all, when he, whether he's in a solo lane on a Vladimir or in a situation like this, trying to engage a uh, Hoyden Canyon. Yep. Knockups being traded left, right, and center as Showmaker Realm warps his way forward, but it's just the walk back strategy Ghost. utilized, and now Ghost is looking for this one, not going to get the displacement on the gravity field. And Down One Gaming are going to get themselves out. But you can see how desperate they are to try and get any sort of momentum back in this game. And they have to be so far ahead of the play because of those lack of item spikes to try to make something happen on the mirror side of the map. And they get nothing. They get Flash out of a support Galio. No other relevant cooldown on the side of Sandbox. Need to respect Ghost the moment he shows himself. Gonna watch the replay. Just look where Noggery is. He's nowhere. He's nowhere on the map. He has no allies on this side of the map. This is how Noggery plays, and it's why some teams have been able to engineer his downfall at different parts of the game. If Canyon's ahead, if Damwon is setting the pace of the game, you can power fight this and not be punished. But in a game like this, where it has to be about respect, not enough sh respect shown, even with summoners and ultimate available. Yeah, someone with a very cute prediction, uh, corrosive charge there that unfortunately missed, but it didn't actually matter. Was able to still pick up the kill. I was wondering why we were getting the, the slowdown on the just kill the Aatrox underneath the turret, but that was a very cute little play. Showmaker up here towards the top side is up to 10 stacks, basically on the Rod of Ages. So just needs to get that Seraph's Embrace done. We'll be able to go back now and I believe complete the Archangels does so. Transformation should be very, very pretty, pretty fast. I would guess around 2630 is my thought, may even be faster. So the two item spike will be nice, but again, no real magic resist in the build yet. Not going to count the Merc Treads. And Dove, you can see now, completes the Merlinomicon. Very powerful two items here on the LeBlanc, but it's two items in comparison to two item parity. As Showmaker has picked up a lot of farm around this map and his items are just a little bit cheaper. That's why the next fight means so much. Infernal in one minute 10. I still feel like Sandbox are in the ascendancy, uh, fighting around it, but right now the setup is not there extensively. And dumb one, speaking of setup, they're trying to punish in the mid lane here. Dove can't poke the minion wave. Yeah, and Summit actually caught out very, very early. Not able to come and defend this one, but the minion wave is going to go down. Still massive damage to that outer turret. Imagine if Shelly had got a charge, Papa Smithy. Been a nice map movement. All Damwon had previously was three control wards around their blue buff to try to defend around Baron's side. Now they're transitioning that vision 
to the Infernal, hoping to fight there, but they could be flying to his summit. Yeah, the vision bottom side is actually fantastic, though, but this guy's just so damn big. Here's the hero's entrance. Quite the only one that's going to get knocked off, but they're happy to get any of these picks. And Nuclear can't get anything done in this team fight at all. Dove just going to solo zone him out of this whole fight. True Shot Barrage for a bit of damage, but a bit is not enough. 5,000 gold now the lead and a big fight win for Sandbox. And Sandbox just know their role. Dove knows if Nuclear does nothing and Urgot and Galio can zone for days. Well, guess what? There's not enough damage on the side of Diamond Gaming. The scaling's not there and they can't hit the same target. They walk up to back. Aaron, what are going to do to stop them? I'm not entirely sure, but this is exactly the Sandbox game plan that we've come to know and love. Realm Warp is going to be utilized there just to get some vision as Joker comes on over it's with W's the justice. Cool okay, there's the double pop, but the rise with the aftershock's not going to get exploded, and Canyon's even going to survive. Now as Joker trying to keep himself alive and trying to keep Darmwan out of this pit, but the Baron is available. It might just be a 50-50s Canyon. Has to go into the stopwatch, and it is the Baron, taken by Sandbox. Only going to lose one, and Nogger is going to have to dive his way over. Showmaker in here as well. So there's a kickback onto the rise immediately. Taunted, but does have the stopwatch, and Canyon wants to be able to get a bit on fleek. The Triumph proc keeps him alive. Joker's going to be sacrificed. It's a double now as the Fear Beyond Death does get the Fear, but has to disdain to get himself out of the Infernal Chains. There's still some Barons on a few members of Sandbox. But this game is crazy. And that's the fun thing. Because of the cleanup there, there's still a game on our hands and a series to move from there. Very important there, the setup from Sandbox. They try to poke out Canyon, but it's in a 1v3, and Dove gives up his life poking over, and then everything falls apart. All the dominoes from that point actually begin to turn for Dumb One Gaming. You'll understand in the replay, if we start the replay early enough, we're gonna first focus on the team fight right at the start. Here's the problem, Summit comes in, the Gallia ult is there, and then the moment that Dove runs at Nuclear, look at who the damage threats have access to. Nobody of relevance, Aatrox passive in a 1v3, gonna be popped instantly. That is a team fight expertly played by Sandbox, but the Baron turn here, we start a bit late to fully understand. Problem is that Dove, who's super snowboard, jumps in dies trying to just interrupt Canyon. And then we actually just have a support Galio with Taunt on cooldown, a Baron that's going down very low. This could have just been a 50-50. This is a better case than maybe Sandbox deserved as On Fleek's Triumph proc actually gets the 200 health on the backside. Summit has a disengage on the ultimate there. Fear Beyond Death as a disengage tool, very rarely seen. It keeps things competitive. 5,000 gold lead, but that could have been the game decider. Now the game is still up in the air. In one way or the other, if you had have watched On Fleek and just kept your eye on On Fleek in that fight like I just did in that replay, he played it about as perfectly as you possibly could. Gets the stopwatch out of Canyon when he was trying to kick him to kill him, and then immediately goes back to his Q that he prepared earlier, executes the Baron, and then doesn't die to Canyon over the wall, gets the kick back onto Showmaker, basically does everything. Yeah, Here's the headbutt, Pove diving on forward. Nuggery's gonna get big damage in here, and now Nuclear can actually fight in the team fight. Double kill for the Ezreal, who has a freshly completed Seraphs in the Archangel stuff, not yet transformed, but Darmwan, that's the fight they needed. And both you and I unconsciously start rubbing our hands and know this game is far from over. Very good punish from Damwon Gaming. Ghost with no flash is a victor. Very easy to close gap on. Damwon trying to push through the mid lane here. Can Sandbox stop them? The minion wave starting to go down. Gargoyle Stone Plate there to keep Summit alive underneath this turret and very healthy as well. But not going to be taking too much damage and thankfully the Barroned Up minions are going to be more difficult to get rid of than they otherwise would be. Ticking over to 30 minutes into this game and as that clock gets further and further on, becomes a better and better game for Darmwon. This is really well played by Hoyt. His Alistair is clean, and they're able to close the gap on to Ghost. He's got no flash. He's a victor. Dies instantly. They thought they were safe, but the flanks aren't warded by the side of Sandbox. It's actually quite brazen to walk up in that scenario with no flash on their bot lane carry. Because of that, they get punished. But there's still a couple of Baron buffs, and still going to be some gold that Sandbox can pick up on the back end. The dregs of the Baron buff, Notice the Baron buff power play, the difference in the gold earned by Sandbox and Dumwad. It's nothing to speak of, basically, so a wash in spite of there being 1,500 gold to open up 
onto the members of Sandbox Game. Damon, in fact, earning 100 more gold over that period of time, being able to pick up so many of those kills, and that fight from Hoyt, absolutely fantastic. And now means after the double kill, that's basically a free Hex Drinker that Nuclear now has, and that could be pivotal in the next fight that we're going to see. Damon, every time they get an advantage like this, it means so much. And there's lights out items. To me, it's a Negatron cloak for Ryze when he can fit it in. It's the Seraph's transformation, because then it's Hex Drinker, Magic Resist, and Shield, and the Overshield, because of yeah. course, shielding works like effective health if you guys are at home, so the more resists you have when you have a shield, the stronger the shield is. So it's not just 300 damage, it's 300 based on your resists worth of extra effective health. So because of that, that temporary health and the Hex Drinker, you're actually relatively tanky to a no void staff on the LeBlanc. So we're really cresting upon some very relevant gold pickups to illustrate the points we were making about Dumb One Gaming at the 35 minute mark. Look at the timer, 35 minutes is pretty soon. Sandbox Gaming, they've made a couple of mistakes so far. They've been made to look honest by Dumb One. The game's still in the air, it's about 4,000 gold lead. No more mistakes for Sandbox Gaming, or well, Damwon Gaming could pull off a surprise victory. Exactly, and it's getting more and more easy here for Damwon as well. Showmaker has that Spellbinder completed. Seraph's transformation is done. Steric's Gage now for Noggery as well as the Stopwatch. The tools are starting to come in and that's for Damwon. About, but everyone has to play their vision. Control wards mean Damwon have to defend through their red side and Sandbox. They control the top side jungle here of Damwon. You need to be so respectful. You have to update. Which quadrant of the map does my team own right now? It's not a red side and a blue side jungle for both teams. Right now it's three quarters to the side of Sandbox and just a red side jungle to Damwon. Playing to your vision line here, keeping those fundamentals around your game and not losing your head with Baron about to spawn again with the Cloud Drake on the rift soon is oh so important for these teams, even if there's been some good small moments for Damwon game. Exactly. Now we're gonna look at Sandbox to say, have they got over what has been some difficult games against Damwon in the past? I mean, if you look at the opposition here for Sandbox, it doesn't look great for them. If you look at their run so far in the LCK, it certainly does. Which Nuggery. Sandbox is going to come in here as Nogri's gonna get kicked back up. Looks for the damage as well, and it has to be used so, so early as on fleek. Now over this wall, Nuclear in the back line is relatively safe, but Hero's Entrance just wants to get rid of this Aatrox. They are going hard for this pick, but he's got so many different tools. They're not enough as the World Ender does expire. And Sandbox get the pick off on the Aatrox. Noggery too brazen again. We saw him in the side lane. Now he walks up too far in the mid lane and gets turned on. We already knew the LeBlanc and Lee sent out a huge engage range. Sandbox coming in and they're definitely not going to be taken down by Ryze and Alistair. They have to back away quickly. And this is such an important timing. It's as Baron yeah. spawns. And the death timer is not trivial. It's 35 seconds. Exactly. And this Baron is definitely not going to last that long, Noggery. Th that might have been the mistake that's cost them this game. As Damon Gaming don't want to give it away without a fight, but four versus five is not a fight that I'd want to take. Is Joker in a little bit of trouble? Showmaker doing so much damage. The last Q comes in as Canyon flashes forward, doesn't get the Baron as that one belongs to Sandbox. But now on fleek in trouble. Hoyt trying to tank them all up. It's a decent kickback, but Nuclear does get zoned by the Lee Sin. And Showmaker fighting Ghost isn't going to win that battle. Not able to contest the Baron. Dove's coming in, and he wants Nuclear for dinner. Let's see if Nuclear can turn this. Yeah, isn't going to be able to get the chain. Nuclear does a lot of damage, but not quite enough against those two members of Sandbox Gaming. On fleek, looking clean on the Lee Sin, secures the Baron, and now Sandbox have their second. Oh, so important that you get the cleanup kills. They can push in with the Baron as well. Killing the Ezio expediently means these death timers mean something. Not sure if they can end the game here, Sandbox, but they might try. Yep, certainly is close, and Nugger is not going to be the one that's going to be able to defend this. It's going to be very three easily. members. Summit is just so tanky as well. Didn't have to use the Gargoyle. So Sandbox so choosing plate. between options here. Nugger, he can come in. Here's Canyon. Yep, looking for the back line there as Ghost is in a fair bit of trouble, but they're looking for the turrets. First kill to go down here for Damwon Gaming, but World Ender going to be propped very early in this fight, and Dove going to go down. Canyon trying to leap away as Summit gets the fear beyond death, but not the fears on the members of Damwon as on fleek is gotten rid of. And now the Realm Warp is going to bring a few members of Damwon Gaming to try and find Summit on the back end. Remember, this is not the Galio that we're used to seeing. Flanky Nuclear Israel. gets a teleport that he wants this time. Hero's Entrance, True Shot Barrage no. not going to find the target. And Hero's Entrance was interrupted, meaning that Joker is going to go down. Sandbox Gaming fighting off more than they can chew, as they have in the past. Man, definitely a fiesta at the end. There are so many cleanup kills. 
We'll watch the replay to understand. This was a bit of a visual box. I didn't understand if actually it did arm on Canyon. He's trying to come in. Yes, does get stunned up by the W from the victor. So actually, his timing is not exactly what he wants. Probably half a second delayed. Not going to be able to smite away there on fleek on point. From there, the cleanup kills come in. You wondered if Showmaker with a bit more magic resist could have taken down Victor on the backside. With the timings, with two members respawning in eight seconds and Aatrox of all people alive, I would have gone for double inhibitor. And there was that slight hesitation where they moused up and then said, wait, no, we can finish the game. The initial call was probably the correct one here as Sandbox do give up a bit of gold. And Galio at the end offers up his life. What he does do is keep up one Baron buff for Sandbox Gaming as Summit's Baron buff doesn't go down. Yeah, Summit able to hold on to that one, but was very close to losing the GA there as Nuclear comes in with this teleport to make sure that the Urgot doesn't get a free ride out. But respecting that true shot, sorry, the hero's entrance, maybe a little bit too much, meant, meant that he's not actually able to keep up with the Urgot. Crab's able to make his way out. Now Sandbox with a 7,000 gold lead. Looking to try and once again break open the base in possibly another lane. Now, Nogari keeps ganking side lanes with no vision. That's the nicest way for me to say what he's doing. <laughs> Slips in and he's like, wait, that's two people and they hurt. We'll back yep. away. Dumb one just trying to delay. Baron buff is only this minion wave, maybe half of the next wave. Nogari's just going to dash his way over here as Sandbox have four members down. Dove just trying to get that poke in. As Hoyt off to the side, flanking position available and Ghost is on the top side of the map, teleport in hand. Cleaning up some minion waves of his own. These super creeps will need to be respected as now five members looking to siege. On this inner turret bottom side, no itty carry. Not necessarily a lot of range, but they've still got Baron for another zero seconds. Yeah, that's why I said it's only going to be half the way yeah, as happening. it approached. So that goes down. Let's look at the game state right now. About 7,000 gold lead here. Still a huge bounty onto Summit because he didn't go down the previous fight and kept his GA alive. We'll have Ghost to have a bit of threat. We'll walk up and difficult for Dumb One to stop this. They don't have much wave clear when it comes to walking up and approaching the lane. And one of the few things Ezreal can't do on patch 9.2 is clear waves easily. So we back away here. Sandbox in formation. Dumb One Gaming. Hit some great item timings, but can they contest Sandbox with a vision disadvantage? Because right now, Sandbox have been very dogged in pushing out when it's safe and then kiting back to where they have control wards and waiting for a face check. Yeah. Now, once again, in damage control, one and a half minutes until that Baron is back available again. Three minutes until Elder Drake hits the Rift. It's only one Infernal picked up by Sandbox. Otherwise, it's clouds and oceans. Someone definitely not wanting to contend with the burn damage of a four Drake Elder. But Through mid lane and third Baron Atlas exactly. of the game. Going to be spawning. Uh, there was another Baron tune down, so Baron gets to its full power around now. Uh, previously, yeah. a 20 minute, basically a 20 minute Baron is pretty sucky. So I think it's like 12 AD, which feels laughable, but you still get, of course, the empowered minion effect and then scales up everything around 32, 33 minutes. It starts to break even, so it's definitely going to be a full power Baron. We still haven't had an Elder, but that may not even be a consequential thing in this game with it spawning in two and a half minutes, a late spawn after the last Drake came in around the 33 minute mark. So we walk up here. Well, Nogger just face checking with Reckless Abandon. And you can see Leandre's Torment doing a lot of damage to this Aatrox who does have a Spirit Visage. This guy is not exactly brittle. Problem is, you got double GA on Urgot Lee Sin. GA come back off cooldown for On Fleek. So that front line is so robust, and Canyon is in the front line. And Hoyt and Nogari, as we know, are these temporary front lines. So actually pulling off frontlining here for Dumb One is more difficult. They really want to catch. Awesome, severe poke from the Ezreal. But right now with a vision disadvantage, that's hard to happen. Turning it into an ARAM probably suits them for now as they can poke down with the Ezreal. But the looming threat of even Joker on the sideline makes that tricky for Dumb One to pull off. Well, now Hoyt looking for his engage opportunity as Joker also doing the same off to the side. Not going to get too much poke there as he just goes back in. Gets a decent double top. Far side. The team. Not quite there. Hoyt just going to get deleted though. As Sandbox looking to make it more. Realm Warp not going to find anyone to safety. As Hero's Entrance gets the knock up they're looking for. And see you later, Showmaker. You're in the death chamber now as Nuclear trying to get his way out. They do get the GA of On Fleek, who's a little further forward than he wants to be. But that has given them enough space to go for this next Baron. 
And with the man advantage, they should be able to secure it pretty easily. Sandbox just playing to their draft so intelligently because of all the control, it's because of the vision control they have around the Baron. They're just able to wait for a mistake from down one. Someone is always going to split off. Either the Alistair or the Aatrox is going to open for an engage. And in that time, you just turn on that one member. It doesn't matter if you have the Alistair ult. One man can be burned down fast enough by the burst damage the Sandbox have. And Alistair turned into Putty very, very quickly. Or Patties, I guess, would be the more <laughs> appropriate thing yep. for a cow. And given that, they get the Baron, third Baron of the game. And with that Baron, they look look for the end here. Showmaker, 10 seconds to be respawn. Finally, a 10,000 gold lead here for Sandbox Gaming as well as they're taking down inhibitors, inhibitor turrets, and everything that's in Darmon's base. Remember, only one Nexus turret does remain for Darmon. And they've been given a long leash. A lot of opportunities for Darmon to get back into this game, but the team fights have just been so, so good. When they've worked for Sandbox, they've always got the Barons. They've always picked up what they need to. Noggery gonna be knocked back into the team yet again, but does have a lot of ways of staying alive. Not gonna live for as long as he wanted to though, and that's on fleet getting rid of him. Summit gets the fears as well as Nuclear. That is not going to be enough shield from that Seraph's Embrace as he gets onto this fountain. But that's the only place that's safe for the Ezreals. The Nexus is going to be taken down and Sandbox will take game number one against Dom One Gaming. Really interesting game number one. A lot of feeling out between two pretty evenly matched teams. I think overall Sandbox deserved the victory. They were very smart around objectives. They made some mistakes that attempt to end there was a bit foolhardy, but overall, they understood their win conditions. It's a tricky to execute draft. Not everyone can play awesome yeah. dudes in the late game without a stained uh, ranged carry to put out reliable damage and actually pull it off. But because of their smart vision control, it never felt like Victor was going to fall off in damage to the Ezreal. There was never actually uh, you know, attack speed and crit being wielded to take down their draft. In the end, very smart play. And we have our questions about some of the decisions from Dam One Gaming. We already highlighted Noggery and his overextensions again and again. But even just items, even just the decision for Rise to go for, I guess, a burst build, because he had no magic yeah. resist in the build other than Merc Treads. And it felt like backline Rise just kind of waited for an opportunity. But awkwardly, Ezreal was also waiting for an opportunity. And then Urgot and everyone else powering through the front line. And then you're like, okay, let's wait them out. As that happens, your front line dies. And as you know, as an AD carry, anyone who's played AD carry knows, your damage is usually the sum of how much your tank line stays alive for you to actually have space to do damage. There was never really space for Ryze or Ezreal to do damage. And then the bulldozer that was Sandbox Gaming's draft just was too clean and too reliable. And three Barons later, well-deserved victory. Yeah, the way they turned their composition into a pick comp at exactly the right times in the late game, I thought was extraordinarily impressive. But Darmon had constructed a composition that on paper works very, very yeah. well. You've got Hoyt, Hoyt in that front line if he can get those engages that we actually saw a couple of. The things work out much better than they did. However, Sandbox's ability to just make a call, go for it, commit to it, and then win was so effective in that game that the opportunities weren't there for Damon. Because the problem is there was never really a front line for Damon. There was one person yeah. either picked or trying something and then turned on and killed. So there was never actually the ability to fight behind a front line. There was a front liner dying and a back liner getting dove. And there just was no in between. So unfortunately, 30,000 plus damage just couldn't be wielded. And the gold graph here is actually a bit more extended than we're used to, but it still does show that Sandbox were largely in the ascendancy, never really ran away with the game. There were some palpitations, but never just decided the game expediently. These are five minute gaps rather than three or two minutes yeah. in other grass, but overall Sandbox just able to team fight better and thus deserving victors. And as you can see, three Barons picked up this game as well by Sandbox and being able to fit three Barons into a game that only went about 40 minutes, I guess, so they were taking them from about on, 25 Alice. minutes onwards. Don't say only went 40 minutes because uh, <laughs> we're getting back to 8.1 territory when we have words. Yeah. Like, ah, short game, 40 minutes. Well, I mean, I'm just saying three Barons in that True. time is, uh, that's a lot of Barons when it uh, does enter the rift at 20 minutes in. And it just shows that Sandbox, they are not afraid to pull the trigger. And let me tell you, after my Sunday, I'm very excited to see a team that can pull the trigger. But they're going to have to do it again if they're going to win this series. A short break, guys, and we'll see if they can take game two.